Action. What's up, guys? Dave Lipson here with a special edition of the Love and Thunder podcast. I have a guest today coming to us um, who is an OG CrossFitter named Jason Brown, the owner of Jason Brown Coaching. And uh, Jason and I realized we crossed paths year, years ago, but he's got a really cool training community going on. And um, I believe in uh, celebrating and really trying to elevate people that I think are doing really cool things in the fitness space. So Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dave. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on, man. We were just chatting and we realized that we had probably crossed paths once or twice before back in the OG uh, CrossFit days. And, um, you know, we, we both kind of came from that original CrossFit early days, kind of elite at, you know, forging elite fitness where it was kind of new on the scene and this kind of counterculture. And since then, it's obviously grown and exploded into something completely different. But as time has gone by, um, you know, both we've evolved and maybe our methodologies have evolved. And what I've realized is that as you get older, uh, especially if you love to train and you really value this stuff, it's important that you continue to train in a more intelligent way to be able to serve your goals and, and in an evolving way. And I was interested just to kind of know maybe a little bit about your methodologies and principles around training for maybe folks who are in the CrossFit space and are thinking about, you know, expanding outwards and maybe evolving their training. Um, what's your story and how did you end up doing what you're doing with Jason Brown coaching and the conjugate conditioning stuff you're doing and all the box programming? How did that actually happen? Yeah. So it's funny. I, I got involved with CrossFit in 2006 because a guy at my gym was one of the first affiliates in Massachusetts. And I saw him doing, I don't know what workout it was, but it was probably Randy or the filthy 50, you know, one of the, the stable workouts back in the early days where you would see those pop up, you know, on a pretty consistent basis. And I was like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> and he was a, actually a former bodybuilder, really big guy. And, um, you know, was making a lot of noise during the workouts. And this is at a commercial gym, keep in mind, but we actually had a, a commercial gym that had Olympic lifting platforms. The owner was a, a retired professional football player. So he had Olympic lifting platforms. It was kind of a, um, you know, a different style commercial gym. And I remember asking him like, you know, probably not in the nice way, but like, dude, like what the hell are you doing? And he was like, you're not man enough to do it. That's so funny because <laughs> now CrossFit's a mainstream band. It's like Starbucks. Like you find it every corner. The gyms are nice. They're pristine. But when this started, it was very much a counterculture. It was right. very much against the grain of traditional strength and conditioning or traditional fitness. And it was kind of like, uh, for lack of a better word, fitness fight club where exactly be in the basement of a church or in a back alley somewhere. And it was just this, it had that raw ruggedness to it and it, that kind of made it at least in my mind intriguing at that point for sure yeah and i think uh you know th there was the competitive aspect to it there was you know when i started doing it um back in 2006 i mean there was only a handful of us that were doing it and um you know the camaraderie and and everything that you get early on from crossfit i think a lot of people you know as they say drink the kool-aid because it's competitive you're competing against yourself you're competing against peers um, so that aspect of it drew me right in. I was, I was, I was full, full on board after that. And I, I came from a strength and conditioning background. So, you know, I, I would say I've always been pretty open-minded as far as training. I've never thought like, this is the only way I I'm, I'm very open to, to learning about different styles of training. And, um, for me, you know, my endurance, I was a, a, a college football player. I was very explosive, very, you know, very type two muscle fiber and, um, was always strong and explosive, but I never had very good endurance. You know, anytime that I was tested, you know, like we, we did like a 40 yard de dash test and you had to do 10 forties, a certain amount of time over your best time. I remember just always gassing out with stuff like that. And, uh, you know, so it was kind of intriguing, you know, cause the side of me was just under developed and wanting to delve more into that and learn more about, um, endurance. And, and, you know, back then the, the, the messages you're getting are like, 
don't do endurance training. If you want to be strong and powerful, don't do endurance training. If you want to be um, lean and mean, you know, don't train like an endurance athlete. And of course, like, you know, there's, there's certain caveats to that. If you are in, a, in an extreme de deficit, then of course, aerobic training can bleed into strength and hypertrophy gains. But um, there was a lot more to that picture that I wasn't aware of then. So um, needless to say, I, I really went headlong into CrossFit. I was doing CrossFit.com religiously, even if I went away, I would do the workouts. And I remember seeing you on the site, you know, almost every week. Um, it would be like five by five back squat and the top score would be Dave Lipson. Um, so when, it was, you know, was, when we would go to the gym. It was kind of like the jackass of fitness. It exactly. was kind of like, what kind of <laughs> stupid shit can we do today? You know, like we would try to take the workouts and amp them up. Um, and I think it's really interesting because like you mentioned a bunch of things in there that I think are going to really resonate with some of our, our listeners and audience. And the first thing is you're a lifelong athlete. Um, and I think a lot of us who do have such a passion for fitness and training realize that for us, it's not just a hobby or something we do, but it, it's, it's a way of life. And it identifies so closely with just getting joy from movement. Um, and when you're done with your sport, like you were done with football and I got done with baseball at, at a point, you can end up in a space where I always say it's kind of like, remember the scene in Zoolander when he walks outside after Hans kind of shows him up and he looks in the puddle and he goes, who am I? Yeah, That's kind of like, yeah. that. you're like, who am I? And then, you know, this thing kind of for both of us, it sounds like CrossFit came around and now it's like this whole new world of opportunities where it's like, it's, it's not all downhill from here. There's a reason to train. Like, you know, maybe the reason isn't playing football, but maybe the reason is exploring the limits of your athletic capacity. And it offers this really exciting, uh, you know, fuel to your fire to ignite the passion combined with, you know, it's so different to the traditional gym community. Like you're not by yourself. You're in a community. You're not worried about looking silly or stupid, but you're pushing yourself and exposing yourself through and bonding through shared suffering. And that's so appealing. And I feel like to a lot of people, it's like, it opens up this whole world where they really can get sucked into it like a vacuum. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember being on CrossFit.com every day and who's, you know, what's the top score? I got to beat that score. You know what I mean? And like, you're like, oh, this video, that guy's bullshit. That range of motion sucks, you know? Like, <laughs> and, um, and it can really uh, take its own life in some ways. But at, at a certain point, you know, you, everyone should be evolving, you know, mm -hmm. like if, if you're not evolving, you're dying. And I think having the background that you have, which is honestly more of a traditional strength and conditioning background. Like I remember I was telling you, I'm like, I know this guy from somewhere. And I realized I knew you from videos, old videos I used to watch on T nation, mm -hmm. where if you guys don't know what T nation is out there, it was kind of like the gold standard for if you're a strength and conditioning coach or a serious bodybuilder in the, in the early 2000s, it was the forum for getting some of the best information. And some of our mutual friends like Christian Thibodeau, the great mm -hmm. minds in their relative field would post on it, powerlifting, bodybuilding, strength sport, Olympic lifting, just really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And having that background, you know, it, it kind of gives you a backdrop to just strength and conditioning in general. And then CrossFit comes along and you're like, wow, this is really cool. Where does it actually fit? So how has that uh, evolved for you? Like, you know, going from CrossFit where it sounds like you were full tilt and drinking the Kool-Aid, how, how has that evolved for you since then? That's a great question. So I think, you know, the, the main thing, what I saw early on was that I did start to improve aerobically, but I also started to, um, you know, kind of go backwards just with maximal strength and, and how, you know, power and, and of course, you know, body composition, um, for me, I definitely lost some size and that to me back then, I mean, this is in my, my, uh, what twenties, late twenties, I think, well, early twenties, late into my later twenties was not super high on my priorities. I, I wanted to stay strong. I wanted to stay, um, you know, within reason with my best lifts, things like that. They were still important to me back then. So I just started to think, well, clearly there's a missing piece here. There are some great pieces to this puzzle, but clearly there's some, there's some low hanging fruit and for strength and power development, I thought that there was a lot of low hanging fruit. So I kind of went down this rabbit hole of, of, uh, different styles of training using block style periodization. And, you know, it was, it was funny. I, I kind of had the answer all along. Cause I had, um, my formal, like my early training and internships with strength and conditioning were done at a facility that was like 100% conjugate based. And, you know, I'd gone to Westside Barbell. I had, um, you know, read all of Louis's books back then. And, um, 
you know, later on, I'd become a special strengths coach under Louis Simmons, which, you know, just kind of solidified what I knew, but I had the answer all around along and conjugate was like such a great blend with CrossFit um, because conjugate actually in, in what it really is, is it's a mixed modality style of training. You're training multiple qualities of fitness within the same week. And, um, you know, again, I think like part of the exploration and just going down the rabbit hole is like, you do learn a lot of things, but sometimes the answers are right there. And you're just not looking, you know, you're, you're just, it's like your eyes are not, you're looking for something that you already have the answer to. Um, so when I learned to combine conjugate with CrossFit, that's when things started to really take off. Now I opened my, my first, uh, my, my only box in 2011. And this was after I got out of the military and my whole goal was I wanted to do it my own way. And that's like the beauty of CrossFit, right? You can open a box and you can program however you want. There's, there's no rules, which, you know, in some ways is, is an advantage. Some ways it's a disadvantage for people. But um, for us, it was like, I'm going to do things with a structure. We're going to follow certain days. We're going to do certain things. And um, we're going to really emphasize people's GPP with loaded carries, sled pulls, sled pushes. Um, we're going to do a lot of accessory work, you know, a lot of single joint work. But of course, we're going to, we're going to mix in. We did the CrossFit Open. Um, we had, you know, that, that system itself produced incredible results. And, um, we were always in the top 30 in the CrossFit open. We were always like one place away from making it to regionals as a team, which was, you know, we pushed very hard a few years to, to make it there. We didn't make it because the aerobic piece was still not done the way I, if I known that what I know now we would have made it, but you know, it's one of those things you're like, you don't have all the pieces quite yet. Um, but but it did pr produce some incredible results. We, we always had, you know, 20, 25 regular women that were deadlifting over 300 pounds, um, always had around, around the same for guys deadlifting over 500. And again, we're talking regular people, not competitive CrossFitters or, or even competitive power lifters. And, um, you know, fast forward the, the, really the biggest piece of it is still the same. It's just how I do it. So we do more, uh, aerobic conditioning in zone two. We are using more measures uh, that align more with keeping blood pressure down so we can get adaptations, particularly in the heart. Um, and that piece of the puzzle has been the game changer. That coupled with the right strength development is, has for us been just a really a big game changer as far as the results people get. But also, you know, mindful, like you said early on, what do people really want? And I used to say this all the boxes I worked with. What do your clients want? Do they want to be a high level crossword? Do they want to look good in their bathing suit and, and feel like energetic and strong to play with their kids? And of course, people always say, well, yeah, of course, the latter. They want, they want to, you know, look good, feel good. And I said, well, if they want to look good, feel good, why do we need to spend so much time developing their snatch and clean and jerk? If someone wants to develop their snatch and clean and jerk, let them do that. Sign them up for one-on-one -on -one training. Let them do that. Hey, I, I, that's amazing that you want to do that. Let's do it in a one-on-one -on -one setting where we can focus on you. Or, um, or more so if you're trying to look good and feel good, why are you selecting such high risk movements when there's a lot of other lower hanging fruit that can do that in a much safer and effective way? Exactly. Um, you know, it's so interesting, dude. So much because like, listen, we run in the same circles, that tradition, traditional strength and conditioning circle. All my buddies are collegiate or professional strength coaches, or just total meatheads. And the main difference that the background that, that we have that most people don't is just one principle, the, the, the said principle, specific adaptations to impose demand. Mm -hmm. It's not random. It's not picking stuff out of a bucket and hoping for the best, but it's actually having like a strategy for progressive overload. And like you're saying, like actually using training blocks or more importantly, modulating intensity and recovery across those body parts because some things you know you can you can do a lot of right you can you can do a lot of conditioning you can you know get a bunch of different energy system development stuff and you can do that quite frequently but when it comes to building muscle and building strength you must have recovery because recovery is where the adaptation occurs mm -hmm. so if you're not allowing the tissue to heal and remodel or if you're not allowing the hormones to recover you're not going to make progress exactly. and i think that's actually kind of the blend of both methodologies of like yes it's constantly varied but there is a framework you know right. overlapped on, on top of it um and i think that's where you know you, you can kind of sift out the more experienced strength coaches and trainers from the ones that only know crossfit and they're kind of operating off of these set of skills that you know crossfit isn't a tool but it's the only thing where I think you and I probably see it as 
um, almost like a color in a color palette. Like where does this kind of fit in and, and how can we do it? And that, that's super cool. So you mentioned some really cool stuff in there about aerobic adaptations and controlling blood pressure. And it's funny, like I'm, I'm actually asking not so much because I care that much about the aerobic adaptations, but as a guy who's getting older and has a lot of muscle mass and, you know, these two things are not going to work in favor of good blood pressure. Mm -hmm. What are some of the protocols you, you, you guys use to, to do that? So what it really comes down to is, you know, you can think of like CrossFit where you have like, let's say a triplet, you've got a 400 meter run, you've got chest of bar pull-ups and you've got thrusters. So you have a lot of global, global demand there. That's going to naturally spike the heart rate. You work more musculature, the heart rate's going to go up as the heart rate goes up. And as you're doing something like a thruster, there is a lot of contraction. There's a lot of bracing that takes place when you brace you constrict. So there's not as much blood flow as you would have if you weren't bracing and having more, um, you know, contractions taking place. So when you want to do things that develop the aerobic system, you want to keep contractions lower. So thruster is a good example. It's a great movement. We know that it will do a ton for people. However, if your primary goal is to develop the aerobic system and you do thrusters as your, you know, as one of the main movements in that session, then you are going to have some interference that takes place with that. The best ways to keep blood pressure lower is to minimize contractions, which is things like cyclical rowing, biking, uh, jogging, um, you know, jumping ropes, light sled drag, even, you know, mixing in some lighter loaded carries. I'm not talking. I think, you know, I think that's what a lot of CrossFitters may associate with what's termed as like monostructural conditioning, right? Which is like one thing. It's not actually like cardio weightlifting, but it's actually something you could do for a really long time, just continuously. It's 100% sustainable. And like people will say, well, you know, kettlebells, you could do a ton of great conditioning, you know, in 10 minute time frame. 10 minute time frame is, is going to be highly anaerobic. It's not going to be the best course of action for aerobic development. And it, there is still a contraction effect that takes place there, which you're not going to get the same amount of, of uh, venous return with the heart. So you don't have the same things that take place, particularly in the left ventricle of the heart, which, you know, we're looking at improving cardiac output, which is a product of heart rate and stroke volume. So it needs to be sustainable. Contractions need to be low. Now, the thing that's cool about CrossFit is where you can make those workouts sexier, right? How do we make a, a aerobic workout that you want to stay in zone two sexier? Well, we use things that are not just cyclical. Like we, we know if I just say, Hey, let's just do 30 to 40 minutes of cyclical work. That's probably going to produce a better effect as opposed to doing you know, uh, a chipper or some, uh, maybe a triplet or something of that nature. But there are certain ways, if we know what keeps contractions lower, then we can still make that work a little bit sexier than it would be if it was just straight cyclical. So that's well, something I, I do regularly because I know that, and even looking at my statistics on train heroic, I know that there's a much higher rate of compliance. If we do things like five rounds of a single arm overhead carry, maybe some body weight work, 20 calories on the bike, 20 calories on the ski erg, um, maybe another load of carry on the other side, something of that nature, where if you look at it on paper, it's like, oh, this is a, this is a really cool looking workout versus 30 to 40 minutes row, bike or run. Yeah. It's so funny. You mentioned that because the words you were saying exactly what came into my mind was like, you know, who wants to be on the stepper for 45 minutes? That would drive me nuts. And the God's honest truth is theoretically, there are things that may work better on paper. But in reality, compliance is the science of this stuff. Whether it comes to training or nutrition, you have to like what you're doing. If you like it, you're going to do it and you probably do it more frequently. So being able to like instead of maybe you're still in zone two, but you're mixing some other stuff in just to keep it interesting or fun, you know, like where maybe instead of just one thing you're you're doing, you know, maybe some biking or some rowing or something monostructural. And then you, you introduce a carry or maybe you introduce some light dumbbell movement or even some calisthenic work but not in an excessive way. Um, I think that's a great way to almost trick people into liking their conditioning. Cause I was one of those guys that was like, I don't want to condition conditioning sucks. I just want to lift heavy weights. Well, exactly. And you know what? I, I honestly, I credit CrossFit because writing programming for, you know, at one point I had a little over 200 gyms I was working with. You have to find ways to trick people to do it. And you work with 200, you know, this is about 40,000 people a day. We're using my training. I had to get very creative to trick people into doing this stuff. 
and they have to like it too. They got to be excited yeah. to come to the gym and be like, what's it going to be today? And I think people get excited, especially when they can look at a workout and not be afraid that it's going to hurt them. Mm-hmm. You know, like if, if I got a back injury or a shoulder injury and I see squat snatches and muscle ups, I'm like, ah, just kind of like, I yeah. don't know what, what am I going to do today? You know, like, and, and having that level, cause it doesn't need to be so complicated. Mm-hmm. Really. I, I think a lot of people skip to the sexy stuff before they master the basics. They want to go right to the muscle up before they can do 50 unbroken push-ups. before they can do a bunch of strict pull-ups. And the truth is there's probably more adaptation there that they can achieve in a much safer way. Um, but I want to circle back to something you said about when you started CrossFit, because I think that like one of our taglines at Thunderbro is it's where bro science meets real science. Okay. Mm. And one of the things that my strength and conditioning buddies told me when I started doing CrossFit, because they thought it was so silly, right? They're like, oh, you're going to dance around and do burpees and walk on your hands and all that stuff. But hey, bro, CrossFit makes guys small and girls big. And I thought about it for a second and I was like, well, you're not wrong. But there's context there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes guys small because most guys is maybe not coming out of college as a D1 athlete, but most guys doing CrossFit are overweight. They have like Mm -hmm. a tire around their waist, right? They're carrying excessive body fat and most girls are under muscled. So yeah, it it makes sense. But it kind of starts to gravitate you towards a certain body type that maybe not everybody wants. Mm -hmm. And and I think that outside of performance, you know, how you look and feel, honestly, I think that's number one for most people. And having a great score is is nice, but you should love what you see when you look in the mirror. You should mm-hmm. feel super duper strong. And sometimes it requires more intelligent thinking and more strategic thinking to be able to achieve that, especially in like a long-term way, because mm-hmm. there's a honeymoon period like back in the day when you were doing it and I was doing it. You're kind of in this first one to three years where like, Every day is a PR. Mm-hmm. Like you've never done this shit before. You know, you've never done these movements or done it with this kind of intensity. And and quickly thereafter, what you'll typically see is kind of a plateau. We're like, hey, not much is getting better. And a lot of times what you'll start to see is kind of overuse injuries, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're like, oh, I got this shoulder thing, but I can do it even though it hurts. Um, and I think this is where intelligent training becomes more important where maybe it's not just constantly varied functional movements executed at high intensity, but there's a little bit more strategy kind of laid on top of it to help people do that. You know, I, I tell folks, I'm like, I love doing CrossFit. I want to do it for a long time. That's why I had to change it. Mm-hmm. And I, it sounds like you, you had a, kind of like a similar journey. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I think, uh, you know, I've seen, a lot of people of working with a lot of people now over the years. And, uh, you know, I, the one thing I wanted to say, I think this is the first podcast I've been on where I could talk about CrossFit and the other person actually knows, um, <laughs> because I've been on a lot of podcasts. Like I was just actually just on Joe DeFranco's not that long ago. And, you know, it's, it's almost a different language as you can probably understand. It's a different language talking about some of the stuff. So I, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of refreshing to be able to talk about CrossFit with someone that actually knows. So, you know, just wanted to to throw that out there, but um, it, you know, I think there is there comes a point where there are certain things that you just feel intuitively don't align anymore with yourself, with your body, with your goals, with your needs. And I've seen a lot of people come to that point. When those people get to that point, and I don't think it's a I don't think it's a um, something that happens early. I think it's five plus years of doing CrossFit, and I'm talking doing CrossFit where you're consistent, you're doing it five, six days a week. And, um, you know, competing in the open is important to you. Those are usually the people that come to me that are just like, Oh, I don't want to do X, Y, Z anymore. And to be honest, I got to a point with programming for CrossFit gyms where I mentally couldn't do it anymore. I actually, I, I sold that business to a coach I had running it because I did not feel good about programming X, Y, and Z anymore. I just couldn't do it. And even though I know it was expected of me to have toe to bar and have, you know, um, some form of kipping pull-ups and Olympic lifting in the programming, we did do those things with a framework, as you said, it just didn't feel right to me. And I just wanted to do, I wanted to have more autonomy to do it my own way and which would be without those things. And, um, I got to that point and I'm like, if I don't want to do this stuff anymore, I don't feel right asking someone else to do it. 
I pride myself on doing everything I, I put out are is training I would actually do and training I do do. So, um, that point I think happens at different stages for people, but I have seen that be kind of a, 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 uh, hallmark of like someone that has just got out of, out of alignment with the style of training. And they're like, you know what? I just want to look good, feel good, but I still want to perform. I still want to be challenged. I still want to do conditioning. That's fun. They, they still know it's important to do conditioning, right? They're not, they're, they're the, they're the people that they get on an online training program. And if it doesn't have any conditioning, which we know, like a lot of programs don't, um, they're like, I know that there's some value of conditioning. I need to find a way to do this where it's done, like you said, intelligently. And it's, it's done within a framework. It's so interesting to me because like, um, you know, I, I, a, after I had a like pretty bad major back injury, um, and my wife had her shoulder, you know, just destroyed for, and, and that's like CrossFit at the upper levels. Right. So you have yeah. that in the context too, but, uh, I was at a point where I kind of felt cornered because I couldn't lift as heavy as possible and I shouldn't lift as fast as possible. And it kind of left me with this hole of feeling like, well, what can I do? Right. Like what, what, what do I have to pursue or how do I still express intensity without expressing it the way that I'm used to? And that's kind of what drove me into hypertrophy training because I was like, Oh, this is great. I can find new intensification methods to really challenge and exhaust muscles and, you know, get that fix of feeling like I'm training hard and I'm progressing with a much lower degree of, of risk of injury. Um, and it became more about like the, the physical adaptations of increasing muscle size and even competing on stage and focusing on kind of like the body transformation stuff behind me. It sounds like you had a similar experience, but it was more like on the strength and functionality. It's like, Hey, I'm, I'm in a corner. Like I just can't get more out of this. How do I change this? I'm interested to know what about the CrossFit methodology did you keep and preserve and what elements did you decide to omit and why? Like, what, what are you still doing now that you did then that you're like, this was a great addition to my repertoire. And what did you kind of like decide, you know what? I don't think this is for me in the long term. Yeah, that's a good question. Mixed modality conditioning is, is a staple. And I think, um, there's a lot of, you know, mixed modality is kind of a, it leaves a lot of inter room for interpretation there. So I still do CrossFit style conditioning pieces. And, you know, if someone in the CrossFit world saw it, they'd say, oh, that's a, you know, it's a good uh, time domain workout where you have X, Y, and Z in it. And I still use that style of conditioning. I find it to be very fun. I still do a lot of things very similar. The One of the, the big things is, you know, I, I don't use a barbell uh, in conditioning almost never but I use kettlebells almost exclusively. So if I do cleans, kettlebell cleans, kettlebell snatches, kettlebell thrusters, you know, you name it, you go, you go down the list of just kettlebell exercises. There's just a, a slew of them that, that align very, very well. They're very user-friendly. Um, people coming from the CrossFit world are very, can handle kettlebells very well. They're usually pretty, pretty skilled that they, you know, they already know how to do a swing or a snatch as just a baseline. Exactly. Yeah. Now, if you go into the regular world and you ask people to do snatches and swings, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag. You might out of 10 people get two people that know how to do them. Uh, yeah. But with former CrossFit people, they know how to do that stuff. So it's an easy transition. And, you know, most of them find it to be a lot more user friendly. They can get a lot more out of it. They don't have pain going overhead. Um, so I still do some form of mixed modality style conditioning. Um, I will say though, like the conjugate system unbeknownst to many is you know, the, the base of it, the base of the pyramid is GPP. And how do you get that? That's what a lot of people don't know about Louis Simmons is he was, I would say equally as good of a conditioning coach as he was a strength coach. He, he, you know, when I went to West side, the couple times I went there, it was like, they were just doing an ungodly amount of work capacity training with wheelbarrows, with belt squat walking, with loaded carries, with long duration sled poles. Um, so we were doing that stuff. We would do combination stuff with sleds, like a loaded carry plus a sled pole. I mean, you want you guys that are crossers out there, you want to challenge, go do a mile sled drag with a quarter of your body weight and uh, a total of half of your body weight in your hands between both sides and try to do that in under 30 minutes. That's a well, freaking challenge for you. Well, you know, what I feel like can sometimes happen is uh, people can become CrossFit specialists, mm -hmm. meaning they're really good at CrossFit, but sometimes they forget about the grunt work. 
Mm -hmm. And while it may not be as skill intensive, you know, uh, there it, it is much more accessible for most people. Like exactly. anybody can carry a kettlebell, right? Like you don't need right. any special skills, grab the bell, brace your belly and walk. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's something to be said about the char characteristics of simple, fun and effective. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't need to be more than that, especially from a conditioning standpoint, simple, fun, effective. People tend to come back. They tend to like it. Um, and, and you know, it's interesting, uh, I'm, I'm friends with, um, some of those guys out in Cincinnati, um, Laura sweat and mm -hmm. Jane, and, um, they had a, a pretty cool program that I had actually talked to them about years and years ago. And it was like, they're, they do something similar. It's like conjugate CrossFit, much more yeah. heavy on the conjugate though. And when I saw it, I saw the program, I'm like, wow, this is a tremendous amount of stuff to try to do each day. Work, yeah. But I do love the fact that we're building versatile capacity in the basic movements, right? Instead of going right to the big complex stuff, we're really attack, let's attack a push up in every way we can. Let's attack mm -hmm. a pull in every way we can. Let's have some way to kind of modulate the intensity and, and the prescription. There was conditioning every day, but it wasn't overtly complex conditioning. You know, it was just nice and simple. And I think there is something to be said with simplicity. And, and for folks out there who are struggling, because uh, I think comparison is always the thief of joy, mm -hmm. you may get to the point where you're seeing athletes at the CrossFit Games doing all this cool stuff. And you assume, well, if you can't do that, what is there for you? You can't, you can't be fit. And that's not the case. I think it just comes down to training more intelligently and, and understanding what you need. Um, you know, and, and, well, that's a, I mean, the CrossFit Games, good example. And the last few years, I've watched it heavy, heavy emphasis on GPP. There is strong man. Like, I mean, how many strong man events are they doing now? Heavy, uh, sandbags, heavy med balls, uh, yokes. You go down the list of strong man, like heavy, heavy sled drags. You build that stuff by doing that stuff. And that stuff, as you said, I used to always say to CrossFit gyms, Hey, how many people can snatch a barbell versus how many people can push a sled? <laughs> right? I mean, anyone can push a sled. So if we know everyone can push a sled, but not everyone can snatch a barbell, why don't we focus on the stuff that people, most people can do and do it correctly? Um, you know, not to say that we, we didn't do snatches. We certainly did. But, um, you know, Louis always talked about the 80-20, 20% 20 classic, 80% special exercises, accessory work. So the 80% is your GPP. And that's where I think everyone... I feel like in CrossFit, everyone says like, this is a GPP program, but then you look at it and it's muscle ups and Olympic lifting. And it's like, actually that's SPP. Yeah. GPP is general. SPP is specific. So that we've got really kind of two different things here. And if you focus on SPP, then you have a higher level of specificity and you're not going to really get people where they need to go, especially in a group setting. It's not individual, it's group. So if it's group, we have to think about the greatest group for the greatest number, which is the sled push. Now, unfortunately, it's it's not the snatch. I know everyone will say it's functional, but sled push is going to affect more people in a positive way than the snatches. Yeah, I think that's a good point is you got to consider what works most well most of the time for most people. And I think that I mean, the, I, I removed myself from CrossFit and now I'm kind of coming back to it in some ways. But for a decade, I taught their level ones. Right. And, and mm -hmm. in and out level one, level two, just regurgitating the words of Greg Glassman. And at a certain point. I found myself thinking like, I just don't believe in all this stuff anymore. It's kind of hard for me to say it. And I started coming up with my own ideas just based on my experience and my observations and my experience with athletes. And, you know, it should be kind of an evolving process. But I think now we have different people programming the CrossFit games who have a different take on it. And I think mm -hmm. there should be probably a blend of both. But back in the day, I don't know if you remember these YouTube videos, there was a saying like, I'm a combination of a Olympic gymnast and a Navy SEAL and, you know, I do. a little bit simpler, right? Yeah. And, and I always wondered, like, why couldn't the test be something a little simpler where it's like, yeah, we test a 10K and then we do a powerlifting meet and then we do a kind of a glycolytic Helen, like some kind of mm -hmm. test. Why does it have to be so out of the box every single time um, and to try to recreate reinvent the wheel in some ways when it doesn't need and the nice thing i like about tests that are standardized is like you have comparisons like you can be like okay well what is an elite powerlifting total or what is an elite 10k mm -hmm. total? you kind of see generally that accessibility for people watching it they can respect 
that kind of level of capacity and versatility, that kind of compromise. But having said that, there's a saying in CrossFit that um, used to be thrown, thrown around a lot, and it was the concept of the black box. I don't know if you remember hearing this, Jason, but the analogy Greg Glassman used was he said, you know, we have this black box, and in this black box, we can't really see what's going on inside. We don't really know what the adaptation is, but we have these inputs. We're making you do thrusters and pull-ups, and something happens in the box, and all of a sudden now we're fit and we can do pull-ups and we have adaptations. We don't know why or whatever, but something happened in there. And I always had a lot of contention with that comparison because I think that really devalues the whole process of intelligent programming. Well, we do know why. I mean, that's, we that's, know yeah. <laughs> we know the mechanisms and, and this became really obvious to me, especially with regard to muscle hypertrophy is like, mm -hmm. first you need to understand the cellular physiology, like the components of a, of a muscle fiber. Most coaches, shockingly, most CrossFit coaches cannot tell you what a muscle fiber is. They can't name the components. They don't, they know muscle, but they can't tell you actually what it is and how it works. And, you know, furthermore, what are the adaptations that take place to be able to get a specific response to increase mitochondrial density for increased endurance or to increase muscle fiber size or to enhance motor unit recruitment? Like there's, there's adaptations that we can look at and measure and then almost reverse navigate. Now, what are the mechanisms that garner those adaptations and what does that look like on the floor when I'm training somebody, right? Because they're all related. So it's not just about like what's written on the board, but it's understanding the principle, the method, the mechanism and the muscle and what you need to do to, to, to be able to achieve that. Because now if you have a target, you're going to be much better at hitting a target versus right. something happens. I don't know what, right? Um, and, and I think that a lot of coaches would benefit from actually investing a little bit in understanding the physiology. I mean, we both had that background just being in that world of strength and conditioning and the NSCA. Listen, the NSCA doesn't do everything right. But one thing they do right is they do emphasize physiology first, right? You need to understand what a body is before you can master how to change it. And, and I think a lot of people kind of glance over that. And, and I think it goes the same thing because it does relate to your programming, your coaching. And now that you know what you're trying to work towards, now you can target it better. And you can do it with more strategy to be able to evaluate it instead of just using a blanket expression that intensity is the cure-all, right? Not progressing, more intensity. It's It doesn't work like that. It works like that a little bit at, at first, but then you're going to quickly run into uh, a plateau. So what are some ways that you modulate intensity and recovery with your athletes? Do you use things like training splits? Are you doing upper body days and lower body days? Like what does the framework look like? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, um, I think that, you know, with, with CrossFit, there's a lot of things is, you know, if you think about something like muscular hypertrophy and we, we, you know, a lot, a lot, there's a lot that we do know now that we didn't know back then, as far as this, the tenets of hypertrophy and, how to tap into more mechanical tension and, you know, understanding muscle damage and muscle damage is one of those things that people will judge the effectiveness of the training on muscle damage, how sore they are. And we know now that muscle damage actually can be counterproductive. We can actually delay gaining lean tissue if we have too much muscle damage on a, on a consistent basis. So, um, I am a very less is more type of coach. Um, we don't do a lot of exercises per session. Um, we do a higher quality of exercises and I, I really ask for maximal intent across the board. As far as the framework goes, um, conjugate is two lower days, two upper days, a speed day and a heavy day. Now, heavy can be in a lot of things. Most people are probably familiar with the max effort method. We do max effort, true max effort about every 16 weeks. So we do a lot of sub max effort. And then within sub-maximal effort, you have a lot of other strategies like cluster so sets, what, what wave loading. What does effort look like? Is that the, instead of like a, a, a one rep or a two rep or a three rep max, is that It's more? anything above a one rep. Okay. Gotcha. So a two RM is technically sub-max. One RM is a, a max effort. Oh, so you know, a true single maximum Singular effort. effort, the most load you can move for one repetition is max effort method. Sub max is anything above that. So sub max, a lot of things fall within that category. So my, my conjugate training follows two heavy days, two speed days for the upper body and lower body. Um, and that's so kind of really like the universal 
uh, adoption of that method. I see that a lot is like, hey, twice a week, you're going to work on the rate of force development. You're going to work on, uh, you know, recruiting as many muscle fibers as you can, as fast as you can at a submaximal weight, but a maximal speed, which is much nicer on the joints than always being maximal effort. Mm -hmm. And then two days a week, we're going to actually test your slow, ugly strength. Right. Yes. And so the funny thing is, is that you get similar adaptations, but different adaptations because the force velocity curve is made up of force and it's made up of velocity. So velocity is our speed work, our dynamic effort, our explosive strength work with plyometrics, with speed box squats, speed pulls, speed benches. Um, and that is an important quality of fitness. As we get older, we lose type two muscle fiber. That's a way that we can, you know, I wouldn't say stop the process, but slow down the process. And I think for former crossfitters that want to feel athletic as they get older, it is a staple method. We use it with people that are in their thirties, forties, fifties, even, you know, I've got guys in their sixties that are training this way. The other end of it is our heavy day. Um, and I think that the psychological benefit of, of not just lifting heavy all the time, which emphasizes the force component, we have that speed component, which mentally it's nice for people to say like, all right, I'm not lifting heavy. I'm not going to a fiber MSA. I'm not doing cluster sets. I just need to move explosively as I can across five sets of five with my box squat. Um, so that's a really nice added unforeseen benefit. And then the bulk of that program really is the accessory exercises, um, for the posterior chain for, you know, where most people are characteristically weak is the posterior chain. We do a lot on the posterior chain. We do a lot of pulling exercises for the upper body. Um, a lot of different variations there, but still within that, that framework is two conditioning days zone two conditioning days that are mixed again, mixed style training. They might have some sleds, might have some loaded carries. Um, but it's not going to be straight cyclical work for 40 to 50 minutes. It's going to have some element of other things in it to make it a little bit more engaging. And that really, um, for the right people is a, an incredible way to train. Now on the other end of the spectrum, I use a full body split. I have basically two types of people. I have the people that are very serious about performance still want to push the limits with the loads. And then I have people that are, uh, kind of more like me at this stage. I I've been conjugate my whole life this past year. I switched to a full body split. The full body split gives me more flexibility. So what, what's your split? I'm just curious to know what, what you do on your, is it a five day split? It's five days. Yes. Oh, yeah, I, what, I, um, what I program for my full body, my full body subscription. We, we do, we do have six days of programming. Okay. The third, the third day is another conditioning day mixed right. modal, usually a little bit more kettlebell heavy. Um, I love but, that because I think that, you know, you can, you can use the conditioning work almost as regen in some ways to be able to flush, you know, joints out and, and help reduce inflammation and heal up the damage because the blood has all the healing factors in it. Right. So exactly. I have athletes that are like you that are like, <laughs> I want to train every day. Well, when it comes to growing muscle, more isn't necessarily better. Right. So you can absolutely still go to the gym, but maybe it's like, you know, serving a similar goal, doing it a different way. It, exactly. And basically, you know, I train, I train four foundational movement patterns in each session, a, a squat or a single leg, a hinge, a push and a pull doesn't get any more simple than that. And we do that three days a week with different variations. So yours um, is a little bit less based on muscle, but more based on function. Right? More based on function. And, uh, you know, to be honest, Dave, I have found with myself and a lot of the people I work with higher training ages, I've gotten better results this year from training with less volume. Mm -hmm. The conjugate splits more volume. It's more yep. time under tension is more mechanical tension. I mean, if you look at, you know, just basic definition of hypertrophy, it, 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 you know, it will foster hypertrophy better than a, this. If you looked at it on paper, you'd say, well, the conjugate plan will be better for hypertrophy for myself. Personally, I haven't seen that to be the case. I feel better, I, more well recovered on the full body split. Um, I don't feel like at this stage of just having a higher training age that I need a ton. I need maximal intense. So I need, if I'm going to do three sets of eight to 10, it's got to be, you know, near max, like, you know, probably one rep in the tank across those three sets versus you know, you're doing five sets of, of eight to 10 and you're, you know, you got maybe one set that's hard. I'm telling you, like, if you, if you listen to top practitioners in their respective field, the one common thing you usually hear is the least amount with the most effect, mm -hmm. whether that be training volume, whether that be the caloric surplus, the caloric deficit, whether that be how much testosterone you might be supplementing the least amount with the most effect 
allows you the opportunity for long-term consistent progress without the hiccups that come along with excessiveness, mm -hmm. right? And you could use any analogy for that. If I'm trying to put on muscle and I'm eating an excessive caloric surplus, a lot of that weight's going to be sloppy. If I'm an excessive deficit, it's going to eat away at my muscle. If I have excessive volume, I'm more prone to breakdown. And you might not even be responding as well. This is a guy that I, I really like who I'm a, a fan of and uh, has actually been such a, a fun and friendly colleague, uh, Joe Bennett. And he works more in the realm of hypertrophy. He works with a lot of yeah. high-level bodybuilders. I've seen Joe. He's a very smart coach. Very intelligent guy. Yeah. Great with understanding movement profiles and really mm -hmm. just imparting the basics to people with how to grow muscle more effectively. And there's nothing complex about what he's saying. You know, take the joints through a full range of motion, move with slow and steady, you know, intent, own positions, um, pro progressively overload movements. And one thing you mentioned, which I think, you know, we incorporate in muscle anarchy is when you're doing an exercise, not every set is balls to the wall. Okay, your each exercise comes down to one or two sets. You usually have a top set where you're going to, you know, go to mechanical failure and RPE nine and RPE 10. Where do your mechanics break down? Where is your threshold? And then sometimes you might do an intensification drop set where it's like, okay, let's drop the weight. Now let's exhaust those fibers completely. Right. But it's not like every single, and that's, that's all you need. Everything before that is foreplay. It's just mm -hmm. setting you up for that working set. And if you can effectively hit those working sets, or even if, you know, like even if you have a training partner to help you out with that four strap or to get that, actually get that intensity, that's where the adaptation is. It's not in the volume, it's in the mm -hmm. quality and the intensity. And I think as you get older, you realize that, yeah, more isn't better. As long as you're hitting a good top set, hit it and quit it. You know, don't be greedy. A lot of people get greedy. I said, be ambitious, but don't be greedy. Don't go mm -hmm. for a 50 pound PR, go for a 10 pound PR and then live to train another day. Right. Uh, because it really is a, a game of averages over a long term. Uh, that's really interesting. So, you know, um, I noticed you're also on uh, Thunder Bros expanded its platforms that we offer some of our programming. So originally we started at this app called Sugar Wad, which was fun. But, you know, everyone's on these different platforms. So we moved sure. to the whiteboard and now recently Train Heroic. And I saw that you're on there mm -hmm. um, running some of your programs on Train Heroic. And what I love about those guys is a lot of these platforms are kind of like exclusive CrossFit platforms. They cater to CrossFit gyms or that's really their main thing. Uh, Train Heroic it was really built for strength and conditioning coaches. Mm -hmm. So they have some really cool advanced analytics where you can gauge recovery and track progress and get all those really cool data points that as an intelligent strength coach, you would need mm -hmm. to be able to evaluate your, uh, your program. So if you guys are looking for some really cool uh, strength programs, functional training, conditioning work, check out Jason. What are some of the programs that you host on there? So my two subscriptions, um, which are, I think the last time I checked there, they were like number three and number five on train heroic and there's 10,000 programs on there. Yep. Um, so those ones have really blown up for us. I have uh, conjugate X conditioning and I have evolve, which is funny because you've been saying evolve. I got an evolve shirt on, yep. um, evolve is the literally the the product of my own training evolving you know 20 20 plus years doing conjugate and feeling like i was you know again i got the greatest gains i hit some of the best lifts um you know i i hit a, a 340 pound power clean even a few years ago um you know and I, i'm i just turned 40 this past uh january so i still was was making good progress but i felt like i was just not quite in alignment i wasn't super motivated um, to train just my upper body or just my lower body anymore. So I switched to a full body split and I've been uh, playing with full body splits. I'm a, a close friend of Chad Waterbury. For those of you who don't know, he's one of the probably most popular, uh, proponents of full body training. I've been, as you said, just like you, I read teen, teen nation was really like my, my undergrad for education. Yeah. Um, I got more on teen nation than I did. In, it was a lot of bro science, but it doesn't mean it wasn't true. It was, it was very good. I, I will tell you from someone that, that has a master's in exercise science, I learned more from teen nation in the early years than I did in my entire master's program. Well, um, I think, you know, we have a lot of people out there like, okay, listen, you take your CrossFit level one or level two, that's a two day course, or maybe you have a, a exercise physiology degree or a master's even that's great, but there's a big difference 
between information and knowledge, mm-hmm. right? And information is shit you read in a book. You watch the presentation, you took the test, you passed the course. Yeah. But knowledge is actually doing it and living it yourself and seeing what it looks like, you know, to, to fail using those principles because it's not the principles, but it's understanding how to apply them that is coaching, right? It, you know, you can't just be like, okay, here are your calories, here are your macros, here's your program, good luck. But you have to be able to coach it and understand it at a deep level and also explain it in a very simple level too. And that only comes with time and experience. Well, I mean, you just hit the nail on the head. I mean, you, you can have all the information in the world. If you don't know how to apply it, what good is it? You know, it's like Louis used to always say, like, I didn't invent toilet paper, but I'm smart enough to use it. I yep. mean, you know, how do you use all these tools? And, you know, CrossFit had a, a tremendous amount of tools. Like I said, I, I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for CrossFit. Um, but knowing how to use all these tools, I think it is, it is definitely as much a science as it is an art form. And I think you alluded to that a few times that there is really an art form here. And that's one thing I just, I always CrossFit really like scratched me where I itched as far as like the art of programming, the elegancy of like a chipper, a very well-organized couplet or triplet. I mean, even like, you know, you think about like a couplet, like on paper, it's so simple, 40, 40, 30, 20, 10 of calories on the ski erg and kettlebell cleans. Yep. So it's hundred total calories, hundred total reps. It's very like, very simple, but like that type of workout, when you, when you do a very well-designed couplet and you walk away and you go, wow, that's, that's magical. That's yeah. what to me was like the thing with CrossFit. You asked me like, what have I kept? That is the stuff that, um, that kept me up at night thinking like, I need to, I need to keep, you know, figuring out ways to evolve with this and, and still utilize some of these things. Cause some of these things really are, you know, just straight genius. Well, you know, after years of, you know, doing this stuff now, it's been, I mean, I started CrossFit in 2007 and was doing traditional strength and conditioning before and taught a, a million, you know, 20,000 coaches have taught level ones to, right. And mm-hmm. there are some coaches that are phenomenal that really do things well. One thing I've come to a conclusion about is if you're going to be an exceptional coach, one skill no nobody talks about is you need to have a lot of empathy. You need mm-hmm. to understand what this is doing to an athlete, how hard it feels, and, and you need to live it yourself. If you're going to be a great coach, do your program. You know, actually do your program and know what it feels what like. What a novel idea, right? <laughs> yeah, and now – when you're coaching someone, you know when they're good and where they're at. You're able to understand how they feel and understand what the target is and be able to get them there more effectively. If you don't do this shit and you're just writing stuff down, you could be destroying athletes or you could just be giving them nowhere near enough mm-hmm. or enough of what they need. And I think that's a, that's a skill like that kind of un- that that understanding where you want to take this athlete and where they need to be and knowing what that feels like and what it should look like being able to listen with your eyes. Like that's a, that's a really important skill to develop. And that's what some of the best coaches do. And unfortunately now, you know, we live in a funky era where there's zero barrier to entry into the fitness industry. Mm-hmm. Now, when I was coming up, if you wanted to be a trainer, you need at least you need to have some kind of decent certification or a little experience. I knew that to be a strength and conditioning coach, you would have to get a CSCS and yeah. probably do an unpaid assistantship and then be a, an assistant coach and then a head coach. And, you know, you had to work your way through the ranks. And it, there was kind of like a circuit on this, uh, you know, this conference circuit with guys like. Juan Carlos Santana and Mark Verstegen and even Christian Thibodeau, right? Mm-hmm. You, you know, you, you look at these guys, you'd be like, wow, these are my heroes. These are like big characters in the world of fitness. I want to be like that guy. And now all you need is a physique and an Instagram channel, mm-hmm. which is great because it provides a lot of opportunity, but it also waters down the entire industry. Um, and it, and it makes it the type of thing where it's kind of hard to differentiate between good quality training information and coaches because it's a popularity contest in some ways. And unfortunately, I think that a lot of the best coaches in the world are people that, you know, most folks don't know about because they're not there making TikTok reels and doing dances and showing their abs, Mm -hmm. they're creating (laughs) champions. They're changing lives. They're, they're 
changing bodies on a, you know, and, and, and they're doing the work. And so I love being able to highlight coaches like you, Jason, and, and be able to say like, hey, yo guys, take a look at what this guy's doing. This is some intelligent training. If you're trying to improve your functionality, if you're trying to, you know, increase your performance or maintain it in a safe and healthy way, you might consider this a little bit more. Um, and it's an honor to get to introduce you to, to, to these folks, because I think people need to know about it. Right. And, and, I, and, you know, given, I think we should be elevating each other and, and trying to really combat misinformation or, or combat bad trends that you just, you know, you just know better at a point. Mm -hmm. right? You just know better. It's yeah. hard. It's hard to build strength. I think Jason, that's like, you know, there's so many different things to pursue in the, in the world and in, in the gym. But I think strength is one thing that can actually be quite challenging to develop, especially for a highly trained athlete. Mm -hmm. um, building muscle in comparison, I think, is much easier. You know, the formula is pretty simple. You get athletes into a caloric surplus, you give them good, healthy training volume and, and intensity, and you allow for recovery time. You do your best to control your internal chemistry in the process, and you're going to grow. But strength development especially at that intermediate to advanced level becomes harder because, mm -hmm. you know, when you start, you'll get stronger lifting a soup can. doesn't right, matter. Right. Do anything will make exactly. you stronger. But then quickly thereafter, you have to be more intelligent. Um, so I was wondering if you could kind of speak to that and kind of some of the things you consider in terms of strength development. How do you deal with an athlete who maybe has, you know, reached a certain level of strength? They've got a you know, 400 pound deadlift or a uh, 350 pound back squat. And now it, it just ain't happening anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think that, um, with the right system, the right framework. And, and again, I, you know, for me, that's the conjugate system as far as the ultimate way to build strength, because again, we are utilizing a huge emphasis on limiting factors. Uh, where people are weak, where, where are they getting stuck? What, what's, I mean, what is the limitation? If they're stuck at 400 pounds in the deadlift or where are they getting stuck? Are they getting stuck off the floor? Are they getting stuck at lockout? Um, is it, is it because of uh, technique? Um, there are a lot of things that we can potentially consider with that. Now you can also go a little bit deeper and consider where, you know, where is someone's resting heart rate that can, that can have an effect. Someone's resting heart rate being overly high will impede their ability to handle stress and recover. So there's a lot to the equation. Now, I think just on a simplistic level, if you think about strength development, we train, again, both sides of the force velocity curve. We get to get the highest amount of motor unit recruitment from there. Now, if we use variations that will help foster um, building, you know, wherever those limitations exist, like different strategies as far as methods, different strategies as far as variations. I mean, you can get into figuring out exactly where someone stalls and start, you know, doing work to improve that. Um, I think one thing that conjugate does very well is that there is a lot of var variability. I mean, it's not constantly varied, but it is varied. So you are doing different variations every three weeks. We're doing different variations of, of accessory exercises. It might be, you know, it might be like the one exercise, the glute ham raise might be the exercise that gets their deadlift up or conversely, like it might be, um, you know, a single leg, a unilateral exercise that helps them break a plateau with their squat. So what we know is that if it's with someone individually, it's a lot easier to figure that stuff out. Now, the way I deliver programming in a, you know, the same way you do, like in a mass, delivering it to the masses, um, we have to go on the greatest good for the greatest number. So I know for people that are using my training, they're highly advanced. They can do glute ham raises and most of them have access to the machine. We're going to utilize a glute ham raise. It's a phenomenal way to build the hamstrings um, specifically at the knee joint. And, you know, it has a lot of carryover to their squat and deadlift. You know, on the other end of it, we know that if we build their triceps, we can usually get some PRs with their bench press. If we press off of pins or squat off of pins um, from higher positions and do some su uh, super maximal work, we can usually get some neurological adaptations as well as just their own psychological advantage to say like, oh, I felt this heavier load. Now, when I go to test it, it doesn't feel as heavy because I'm, I'm uh, comfortable. I just handle 500 pounds. Now I got to do it through full range of motion. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a very, very nuanced question. There's, there's a lot of different directives, but I think as a whole, if you spend the bulk of your time working on accessory exercises for the, for the hamstrings, for the glutes, for the upper back complex, um, you can get just a really big bang for the buck. That's where most people are limited. And then, you know, you couple that with just daily postures. What, what are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, we're looking at our iPhone, we're sitting, we're in internal rotation. 
adduction. So we want to pull people out of that with more external rotation, abduction. We do that again by just hammering the backside. Um, so, you know, if I get a guy that is deadlift stuck and I have him do, I just introduce reverse hypers and just programming. Usually it's that simple where I get that to go up. Another thing too, is you introduce speed work to someone that doesn't do speed work. They hit, they'll break those plateaus every time. So I, I actually disagree with you. I think getting stronger is pretty easy oh, yeah, um, yeah. under the right circumstances. And yep. of course, with the right tools, I, I don't think it's particularly hard. Um, but there's again, a lot of questions to ask instead of just, you know, guessing we can actually assess and figure out how to do it with a one-on-one so, -on -one client. I've never had an issue with um, getting them stronger. The issue I usually have is getting them to do less. Yeah. Especially when you're a CrossFitter and you're just like the more it's, it's the more is better mentality. I think, you know, there's this guy in CrossFit, Rich Froney, who's a legend and he's the Michael Jordan of the sport. I got a Rich Froney hat on right now. Yeah, so, he's, uh... <laughs> he's right. But, you know, he's one of those guys who's like, he would train eight times a day. So everyone's going, well, if a rich trains eight times a day, I'll train eight times a day. And what you don't realize is that there's so many factors in there, you know, his genetic capacity, his fiber type, you know, what he, what works for him that can all be different, you know, paired with the fact that he, when you watch him train, it's, it's not all max effort training. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I wanted to comment on though, is like, although conjugate is usually categorized as a strength training program, a lot of people don't realize that sometimes upwards of 80% of it is bodybuilding is hypertrophy work, is repetition work, and kind of like what you're saying, like working on lagging body parts and identifying what's weak, how do we increase it? Um, and, you know, for the CrossFitter, for the average CrossFitter, we talk about these different models of fitness, right, in CrossFit that kind of all describe fitness. One is called the list of the 10 general physical skills. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, contains things like, um, you know, Cardio, respiratory, endurance, stamina, strength, power, speed, coordination, accuracy, agility, and balance. And then those top four, they represent biological adaptations, meaning there's a change in the tissue. You can put it under a microscope and see increased mitochondrial density, increased muscle belly size, increased muscle belly length, all that stuff. Uh, in the, the bottom four, coordination, accuracy, agility, and balance, those are neurological, like how well can your brain communicate with your body? And, and the middle two, power and speed, are influenced by both. I think that most CrossFitters are actually really good at the neurological adaptations. They know how to cheat really well, Jason. Okay. Mm -hmm. They can do kipping pull-ups and they'll, you know, do, do they got a, a people with like, you know, a, a smaller guy, 150 pounds with almost a 400 pound deadlift. Mm -hmm. They understand positions. They understand patterns. They have the software. What's missing is the hardware, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you have the, you've maximized your contractile potential, at least to a large degree, but where they haven't maximized is their physical body is in their hardware. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where something like conjugate or some kind of hybrid, like what we do with, you know, bodybuilding overlapped on top of GPP or just functional training. I think that's where a lot of these intermediate level athletes probably have the most room to grow. Uh, and it becomes just a method of like, well, how do we do that effectively with them? And it doesn't need to be like an abortion of CrossFit, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have to get rid of it entirely. But I think there are definitely some really intelligent ways of kind of smelting it together. And that's what's kind of cool. Like, you know, you as a practitioner, or an athlete or a coach, there's no hard and fast way to do this. Like it should be almost like a, a unique blueprint, you know, snowflake. Everyone's going to respond differently. And your job as a coach or an athlete is to figure out what's that formula for you and have a process of prescribing, assessing and adjusting on a regular basis. Because what worked for me or what worked for you years ago isn't necessarily going to continue work. You just mentioned, yeah, your training has changed as, you, as you've gotten older. Um, so I think it's really cool, man, dude, I, it's, it's been such an honor to get to talk to you. Um, tell folks, you know, what's your handle, where can they find you? Um, give us a little bit of a, of a, a selfless pitch here. Yeah. Well, Hey, the last thing I'll say to that end, I think, you know, anyone listening, just to remember that strength is the ultimate biomotor ability. If you increase strength, you're going to, you're going to decrease your Karen time. You're going to decrease your Fran time. 
You'll probably even decrease your filthy 50 time. Go down the list of CrossFit benchmarks. You'll do better in the CrossFit Open if you get stronger. Now, of course, there's an aerobic component too. You need to have a better aerobic system to get better in the CrossFit Open. But if you get stronger, I guarantee you, you will do better in the Open this year than you did last year. So um, I would just, you know, impart that on you guys to, you know, just pr prioritize getting, get stronger and get stronger by figuring out where you're weakest. Um, as far as uh, where to find me, it's Jason Brown Coaching across the board, Instagram, YouTube. We're we're um, we're we're going to gear up to do more YouTube, more long form uh, content. And I think that, like you said, it's it's Instagram and TikTok. I don't really do TikTok, but Instagram has kind of become, you know, what looks good, right? So like the workout looks good. So people go there for like people aren't really going there to like learn, get educated. They're going there just to like kind of scroll and and see what looks good, like food channels do really well on Instagram. Um, a lot of my stuff is kind of dense and I, you know, I don't have a particularly big following. I think, think because a lot of the stuff is a little bit more dense. So we're, we're trying to make a shift more towards YouTube, more long form stuff. So if you're interested in learning more about training, um, there's, there's a lot of stuff on there already, and there's going to be a lot more in the, uh, coming weeks and months, but Jason Brown and, uh, yeah, I've got two subscriptions in, in train heroic as well. Um, so there's both free trials for them. So you guys are more than welcome to check that stuff out and uh, see if it it, it uh, works for you. What a cool environment we live in now. You know, like when I was coming up, the only way to make a career in training would either be to own your own gym or to be a, a career strength and conditioning coach at a university with a professional sports team or something like that. And now just online training, it's really changed the game. I know you got into this in 2015. That's a similar time to when we started doing stuff. You know, we had owned a couple of CrossFit gyms before and mm -hmm. people who weren't in our area were like, hey, I want to follow the gym's programming. Can you send it to me and whatever? And so we just started charging a small fee to see the training and stuff. And it became now like very quickly we said, well, forget these gyms. This is way better. My <laughs> roster is limitless. We can reach so many people. And one of the hard things uh, is, is like, well, you know, the great thing is you can have a zillion, bazillion athletes, but the hard thing is you're not physically there with them. Right. Which means that you need to be better at communication and education. Um, and actually one thing we're kind of evolving towards now is actually coming up with our own like online educational modules for athletes and coaches who want to understand how to do this stuff better. But I know that you're such an intelligent guy that I would definitely check out some of the videos because it's not just doing things for the sake of doing them. There's real intelligent thinking. And if you're someone out there who's hit a roadblock, who's not getting anywhere, who's feeling discouraged, you program hopping from one thing to the other thing, going from one competition program to another competition program. Sometimes you got to be honest with yourself and mm -hmm. say, you know, it's, it's, what do I really want? What do I really need? Because it's usually not what the most elite level CrossFit athletes are doing. Usually it's the stuff that it's like, Hey, how can I maintain an exceptional level of strength and functionality and love the way that I look and be able to do this stuff for a really long time? Because we all love training, and I think it's the kind of thing that we want to do as long as we possibly can. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. I, uh, you know, I got a lot of uh, traction with writing articles. Like, I submitted a lot of articles to Teen Nation about CrossFit, and they rejected all of them. Uh, but funny enough, one of them that they did accept was CrossFit for Meatheads. I don't know if yep. you've seen that one, but that was one of the ones. I'll that check actually, that out. I'll go read that right now. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, that was it's really old now, to be honest. That sounds uh, like that actually sounds like Thunderbro to me. Cross <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it was a great article. Um, you know, most of it is still, you know, I probably would have changed some of the things about it now, but um, but needless to say, you know, a lot of the traction I got was just getting questions from coaches at CrossFit gyms and then just saying, you know what, I don't want to answer the same question over and over. I'm just gonna write an article for it. Yep. Um, so, you know, the education side of it is, is definitely, um, uh, you know, something I, I, I do, but it's, uh, you know, we, we try to lead with training and, and, you know, once people do the training and they feel, they see the results and, you know, they see that, uh, they can do less and get better results. Then that's when people start, people that are coaches start saying, geez, I want to learn more about this stuff. And good news yeah. is that there's, you know, I've written over a thousand articles. So there's, there's plenty of information out there that you guys can just no one, you know, you don't have to buy anything from it. You can, you can get all this information for free and, and absorb it. Yeah. And I think like, you know, sometimes what's unfamiliar, you, you immediately assume, well, it's not going to work or I'm not going to mm -hmm. like that. I would encourage you guys to, you know, kind of be fitness adventurers in some way and try different stuff. You know, I, I never thought that I would like Zumba class. I fucking love Zumba. 
No it's shit. My favorite dude. I mean, you know, it's like I go in the gym, I murder myself in the gym. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I even go and driving to the gym, I'm like, this is going to be fucking terrible. <laughs> it's nice to have just to like let go of the expectations and just enjoy moving and having sure. fun and using his regen and get your heart rate up and be in a different environment, right? I'm not um, thinking, right? Like, it's like there's no thought. You're like, oh, just letting someone else just like dictate what I'm doing today. You know, it's so funny. Like I, I think the article writing stuff is great because, um, sometimes, you know, just the 30 second video can't do it justice. Um, yeah. In, in 2017, the directors of CrossFit, Dave Castro and Nicole Carroll asked Camille and I to come up with our own course. And they're like, you want to do a competitor course and yada. And we talked about it. And this is right when I was really studying hypertrophy and working with this guy, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, and figuring out how could this work with CrossFit. Mm -hmm. I said, I got the great idea for a course. It's a you know hypertrophy for CrossFitters, CrossFit hypertrophy. And they laughed at me. Oh, man. I said, what do you mean? Like I would have like, taken that in a, in a second. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, there's all this stuff. There's this cellular physiology, methods, mechanisms, practical application, you know, muscle tension, metabolic stress, micro to all this stuff. And the nutrition all is a tremendous amount of science and layers. It's well studied studied to support this beyond just bicep curls. And I said, well, you know what, let me write an article about it and I'll let you read about it. Cause I, I think I read that article. Mm -hmm. Was it, so, it was, it was talking a lot about like just the value of getting stronger. Um, well, it was in the journal, right? Actually. So not that one, because this one, I started writing it and it started getting really long. So I wrote it and I was like, well, there's this piece and that piece. By the time I was finished, it was a hundred pages long. And I was like, yo, this is probably like a five part thing that I got here. I asked the journal, if I give this to you, would you own it? And they said, yes. And I thought, well, fuck that. Yeah. yeah. You're just gonna, you guys are just going to squash it and keep, and I'm going to just sell it myself. And that's how Thunder Bros started. That was our first book, Hypertrophy for Functional Fitness. No kidding. And wow, so awesome. like, you know, it, the, the honestly, guys, whether you're an athlete or coach, you got to educate yourself real quickly. Shout out of a cannon. I love asking guys this. Working on lag and body parts for common areas of breakdown, I want to know, let's just call it your top three for different orthopedic issues or areas where people commonly experience breakdown. So what are your top three exercises for, say, athletes dealing with lower back issues, degenerative disc issues, annular tears? What are some of the, the maybe the specialty exercises you might prescribe for that? Yeah, good one. So I, I, the, I think the first thing that that comes to my mind is with with those types of issues, especially if it's on a higher level, would be just doing sled drags, right? Because sled drags is no axial loading. We can strengthen the posterior chain. It's actually a great conditioning tool too. You can use it both for heavy as well as light. Um, so so it has just a ton of versatility. In addition to that, the sled is a great tool for the upper body. Again, same thing. If you you know for you, if you did a heavy upper body session and you were just completely smoked. The next day, if you did some sled pull extensions, some sled pull face pulls, you'd feel a lot better. Again, oh, no I remember load. doing those a, a, like a quarter mile with the pulls and then a quarter mile with the presses. That exactly. Was exactly. Yeah. Yes. So that would be the first thing. And I think that people probably, you know, the, the first like objection is, well, I don't have a sled. Well, the good news is you get a sled for about a hundred bucks. Yep. So I, I work with a lot of- You might get made fun of by your neighbors, just as a caveat, but fuck those guys. They're Do you want to know what's play. funny is um, my last, uh, our last house, uh, we lived in a cul-de-sac and I had three or four of my neighbors that were CrossFitters. Okay. So, so they started asking they're me to borrow my stuff. They're probably joining in with you. And, and then there was two women that were in their fifties that saw me pulling the sled. They asked me, what does it do? I said, the better question is what does it, what does it not do? Yeah. They both bought their own sleds. Oh, and I awesome. look out my window and I see them pulling their sleds and I, I, so gonna, I can't gonna make this stuff up. And there's going to be one of those yellow signs with a person pulling a sled. Like, e watch exactly. <laughs> so, you know, it's about a hundred bucks. And um, I think that a lot of people that are, that are crossfitters or former crossfitters are very serious about their training. A lot of them invested during home, you know, their own home gyms during COVID. Like, you know what? Hey, you're saying I can't work out anymore. That's unacceptable. I'm going to build my own home gym. Um, so we've got like, Hundreds of people that have their own home gyms and have their own sleds. We got to make that, a Jason Browning sled for the uh, the stay at home dad. <laughs> yeah, 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 I we've we've I get more questions about my sled than I do anything, and it's just an old West Side Rogue West Side sled. You yeah. know that again cost me about a hundred bucks, but um, I would say the sled they and get then kind of noisy. But if you put your headphones on, everyone else can hear it, but not you. Exactly, you know? exactly, yeah. Um, as far as you know, other things for the back. 
you know, one of the things I've seen tremendous value and you normally I go to like my normal, like sagittal playing glute ham raises, reverse hypers. If you've got access to one, um, you know, you know, doing some direct glute work, some bridges, hip thrust. But one of the things I've seen tremendous value with is getting outside of the sagittal plane and doing more rotational, um, RDLs, cross body RDL offset kettlebell deadlifts, so um, offset have, are, you know, Romanian you deadlifts. Seen, uh, you know, th there's, there's always new fitness fads coming up, Jason. Mm -hmm. Right. And one thing I've kind of seen that I, I, I mean, I've seen it before, but now it seems to be gaining steam and popularity is this kind of, um, almost like spinal engine community that is like against spinal bracing, but the, no, the spine provides movement. So there's this guy, David Weck, the inventor of the BOSU ball, and you've got Landmine University. Yeah. And it's an interesting addition to traditional spinal bracing because mm -hmm. they are right. With a lot of athletic movement, the spine is not a brick. There's levels of bracing, but there's also levels of compression and extension happening in both ways. So it's kind of interesting to see, again, the context of how you're applying things like that. Yeah, I, I, I think that that stuff is definitely underutilized. Um, you know, a Turkish getup is another great move. And I, I hate doing them, to be honest. I, I would rather watch paint dry, but I know that there's, you know, it trains all, all three planes of motion and it, it's, you know, it, it, as CrossFit says, it's core to extremity, really. I mean, it's everything. I mean, there's, there's really nothing that that movement doesn't do. Um, so I think that a lot of people could benefit just getting outside of the sagittal plane but pulling a sled has just so much application and, and that's so simple too, right? It's like, so simple. And if, you know, if I, if it, someone had a severe issue, I'm not going to recommend that they do anything. I mean, there's just, there's just not enough that we know, but I can almost recommend that anyone can pull a sled and there's not going to exacerbate what they have going on. Yeah. I mean, like, listen, with any injury, I, I usually default to just a three part protocol, like stop doing the things that hurt, <laughs> you know, so remove the pain generators uh, number two, figure out what you can do because movement is going to help with recuperation. So right. even if it's going on the elliptical or getting some kind of light movement to bring blood flow into that area, and then finally introducing maybe some preventative or rehabilitation exercises, it's kind of like the same way you would attack gut dysfunction was like, let's do an elimination diet with these movements exactly. and slowly reintroduce them to see if you can handle it again. Mm -hmm. uh, what about shoulder related stuff? What are some of the common things you like to do for guys like cranky shoulders, shitty shoulders, labrum tears, supraspinatus stuff? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So novel angles. I mean, this isn't a new concept, but, you know, working a lot of novel angles, um, teaching them how to press with better scapulohumeral rhythm with things like the landmine, you know, where they can get good upward rotation and elevation that those, those things have, have, uh, have, you know, been just game changers. The other thing too, is I, I do love pressing with kettlebells. I love pressing with, um, you know, neutral grip dumbbell, dumbbell push press. I love, I love that you press. say that because everyone who comes to me with the shoulder stuff, the first thing I say is get away from the fucking barbell. Mm -hmm. Stop doing the, because that is going to internally rotate you and whatever's going on in there is going to have less room to operate. And exactly. usually that's trigger. And you can get so much out of dumbbells, dude. I mean, like, you know, I never, I, I love, I got a set of dumbbells in my garage. It's like five to 180 pounds. They're <laughs> awesome. Okay. Yeah. Like you can do some gnarly shit with them. And, and I think just being able to just 45 degree rotate the hands. Now, this is a much more natural or the multi-grip bar. I know Elite FTS mm -hmm. makes a fantastic cambered multi-grip bar. Yep. I mean, that's, that's stuff that if you know you have these, issues that tend to break down, you should have that in your home gym. You should have special equipment for you. For sure. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And like, again, there's, there's a lot of different strategies you can use. Sometimes it's, it's, you know, developing the upper back complex to, to get them out of uh, those, you know, those injurious, like those painful positions that they're in. Um, but those are, I mean, kettlebells, dumbbells, and again, benching from novel angles. Um, I like, I also like some alternating work, you know, um, alternating pressing where we're, you know, we're getting again, good, um, we're getting good movement of the scapula and it just tends to open guys up because a lot of guys, uh, you know, tend to be very tight and they're, you know, very tight in the lats and you know, their, their range of motion ends up being like here. Yep. Instead of being able to like really fully reach and get you get really rounded forward. You know, if, if you are someone who's sitting, 
on the phone. It's it's just like sitting is probably the worst fucking thing for you in the world, man. I'm like exactly. I'm gonna get out of this chair and I immediately go to the gym and do some reverse hypers and press ups because I just it hurts me. Exactly. Um, yeah, but, for sure. Yeah, like you you need to kind of like brushing your teeth, like just get out of the shit three times a day and open yourself up. That mm -hmm. that compounds. Um, and then finally, the last one, and it's interesting because I've heard a lot of different recommendations on this. What about people who have knee related issues, patella tendonitis, meniscus related things, any kind of, you know, exercises that you find work generally well for shitty knees? The sled. Yeah. The sl that. Again, the sled's a catch all. Um, the sled is a tremendous tool for, for knee health. You know, a lot of people are exacerbating their knee issues by doing the common, like they go to the gym and they run on the treadmill. They do go jogging on the street. Um, you know, running is the most injurious. Running is more injurious than CrossFit is, uh, believe yeah. it or not. So I think golf is too. I mean, I'm terrified to swing a golf club. Like, <laughs> he has a lot of rotation. Power there. I have my rotational power combined with my bad discs. That's going to fucking. Blow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think pulling the sled would be, be a, you know, a great, uh, a great addition. Now you can squat to a box, uh, a box squat, kettlebell box squat, a barbell yep. box squat, um, get yourself in more of a vertical, uh, shin position as opposed to more knees over toe, which is another, you know, topic. I think a hot topic today is what's your take as, on the knees over toe guy. I'd be interested to hear, hear this. I, I think that, that, you know, again, do the knees go over toe in athletics? Of, of course they do. I think that there's some legitimacy to, to training that, um, for people that have knee issues, I, I've got a little bit of, of, of patella um, tendonitis. I mean, I, it's not terrible, but it, it tends to get exacerbated by a lot of knees over toe, which I have experimented with uh, in my own training. You know, of course, if we're loading it and we're using actual resistance. Um, so I, I don't particularly love it for those individuals. I don't think it's a one size fits, but I think that there is some well, efficacy to it like, for sure. You see these people trying to kind of, create some kind of blanket cure-all when mm -hmm. it's really just a piece, right? It's like, oh, well, your stuff is, is, is hurt. We'll just go through these radical ranges of motion and build capacity and it'll be fine. Now that might be one piece to it and it could help, but it doesn't mean that that's going to be the cure-all, right? And, and I think that that's where having the tools in your tool, because you don't know what you're going to respond to or what mm -hmm. your client's going to respond to. So right. you better have a couple different plans of action to attack that beyond just shove your knees forward and hope for the best. You know what I mean? Well, you know, some things are, you know, inherently good movements, but they're not inherently good for everyone. A deadlift is a great movement. It's not a great movement for everyone. Reverse hyper is great for lower back health, but not some people will make their lower back health worse. Box squats, a great movement. Some people will have their back issues uh, exacerbated by using a box squat and sitting back. Um, so, you know, again, you blanket statements and, and just saying like, this is the way is that, I mean, anyone that says that, that this is the way I'm, I'm running away from. It does look sexy on Instagram. Though. It does for sure. Yeah. And it definitely well, gets clicks. I'm going to be able to dunk a basketball and deadlift 500 pounds. Yeah, know? exactly. Um, yeah, that's cool. You know, I've heard on the knee stuff, I think you're right. Like, you know what the patterning people are used to it kind of makes them more or less susceptible to certain industries. So, you know, in injuries. So people that are maybe not able to get in their posterior chain as well or not patterned on it like they're patterned on the running or the cycling whatever it is very kind of like knee driven movements mm -hmm. they don't know how to use their backside so well so learning how to use the backside and i actually it was interesting like i i'd heard this from louis simmons regarding knee stuff was he uh and there's so many ways to to accomplish this but mm -hmm. when he was talking about shitty knees he said okay well do 150 seated calf raises and 150 banded hamstring curls mm -hmm. so when you think about that you think about like what is that accomplishing well, yeah, like you're stretching and strengthening the components of the lower leg that could probably tug on the knee if there are bad knees, or you're connecting with your hamstring a little bit and learning that, or the box squats too. So I think it's kind of the principle and the application, and you got a bunch of different ways to try to accomplish it. Um, and I think like, you know, one thing I would try to advocate to people out there is if you're hurt and you're discouraged and you feel like, the, you know, the wind's been taken out of your sails because... You're starting to break down or you're not who you used to be uh don't don't abort yet right because there's always where there's life there's hope 
And all you got to do is keep trying and keep searching. There's going to be something out there you're going to respond to. It might be exercise, might be nutrition, might be stem cell therapy, but there's a way you just need to keep listening and keep trying and, and don't focus so much on the things that you can't do either. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times my athletes will get fixated on the few movements they can't do instead of the world of movements that they can do. So exactly. I, there's there's always a way dude it, this has been such a fun conversation i hope we get to connect again um absolutely and uh for those of you guys out there jason your handle is at jason brown coaching yes all right awesome dude uh we're gonna end it here and uh check out jason brown great guy veteran og crossfitter super intelligent coach has some really cool training at Jason Brown Coaching, including conjugate conditioning. His products are on Train Heroic. And uh, add it, give it a shot, add it to your repertoire or absorb and regurgitate to all of your athletes. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Thanks man. I appreciate it. Awesome. All right. I'm going to end this recording now.